Okay. So we want to wrap up our discussion on constructability. And, and so let me just go back to the original problem we had of what can we do with a compass and straight edge? So what can we do with a compass and straight edge? And, and while you should think, well, the obvious thing is with a compass, I can make circles. And with a straight edge, I can make lines, right? So, so I can just make circles and lines. But then we said, well, Descartes, thinking about this, realized that if, if we were to describe the set of points contained in that circle and that line, for the circle, we would just get x minus the x value of its center plus y minus the y value of the center is radius squared, where here this is some center AB, and this is a circle of radius R. And your line can just be described also as some linear relationship between x and y. And so what that gets you then <clears throat> is that if you want to figure out what you can get from compass and straight edge, it's just going to be the intersections of circles with circles or circles with lines or lines with lines, right? Because ultimately you're just doing lots and lots of um, procedures, but ultimately it all has to do with drawing a line and seeing where it hits one of these other objects, another line or another circle, or seeing where two circles intersect, so forth. And so when you ever solve a, a system of equations of either two equations of this form or one of this form and one of this form or, or two linear expressions, um, you always end up having to solve some kind of quadratic or simpler, you know, or a linear. If it's two lines, it's a linear equation. But if it's like two circles or a circle and a line, you solve in a quadratic equation. And so Descartes' insight was that some number alpha is constructible means <clears throat> that alpha is a root of a quadratic. But actually something a little bit stronger, it's not um, because there are some, some quadratics that have uh, very complicated roots, but, but all, all this means <clears throat> for us is that you can get alpha from the rationals with, by throwing in square roots as well. In particular, if you start out with, if you start out with the rational numbers, and then you extend that field to get some new field, I call it F1, which can be extended to get F2 and so forth. You can keep extending it to eventually get FK, which I'll call my, my rationals extended by alpha. You can eventually get that alpha, where at each step, your Fn was just the previous guy, Fn minus one, extended by the square root of A for some A that was in Fn minus one. So just by using, just by using square roots, by extending square roots, we're able to recover eventually alpha. Right now, you might have to do a couple square roots. So, so alpha may come out to be something like the square root of some rational minus the square root of you know some rational plus the square root of some rational or something like this, right? <clears throat> but the point is, all you need is to get um, add on square roots, and then you recover you recover all of your all of your um, constructible numbers. And then the last observation that gave us is if you want to think about what is the degree of Q extended by alpha over Q. So here I'm thinking about Q extended by alpha as a, as a vector space over the rationals. Well, that vector space will just have degree two to some power due to the K say. Okay, so that was, that was the story for, for what's going on with constructing with compass and straight edge. How might we tell a similar story if, if now we want to change the setting slightly from compass and straight edge 
to let's say we want to figure out what's going on with compass and a marked ruler. <clears throat> well, remember with the marked ruler, we have this one extra move that given, given some point, so I'll call this some point O, and given two lines, let's say line L and M. So this is, this is M, this is L, <clears throat> and given <clears throat> and given some distance, I'm going to move this O a little bit, it's be easy to draw it, but you can have O anywhere. And given some distance, some distance D, the claim was we can use the marked ruler to, to find the line that passes through O, such that the distance between the points that fall on L and M on that line have distance D between them. That one looks a little bit too short, so I guess we can go a little bit further to the right. Yeah, something like that probably. So, so there exists some, some line through O and, and you can verify this exists by using something like the intermediate value theorem, because if you do a line over here, it's too short. If you do a line like over here, it's too long. So somewhere it would be just right, right? So somewhere it would be just right. Somewhere you can draw the line that has distance D. Now this is not an operation you can do as compass and straight edge because you can think as you slide your straight edge along, well, you never know when you're right at the right place, right? Um, so what this allows you to do with the marked ruler is as you slide your straight edge along, you can be seen by the markings on the ruler when you achieve distance D between those points. Okay, so this is the extra move that we get. Let's think about what that lets us do that we couldn't do before. We can still do these things we did before. We can still draw circles and lines. So, so anything that we were able to construct before, we can, we, can, we can still construct now. So all of these values should still be constructible with a compass and marked ruler, but we have this extra move. And so let's think about what that gives us. To do this, I'm gonna simplify this setting a little bit. We're going to assume the point we're dealing with, let's assume the point we're dealing with is at the origin. So I'm just going to place O at the origin, zero, zero. And <coughs> I'm going to place this line L. Well, I can, I can, you can imagine rotating such that the line L is just some horizontal line in your plane. Some line of the form, you know, Y equals some, some height B. And then there's some other line that we, I'll come back to in a little bit, some line M. But I want to try to think about, well, what are these points that are distance D away from L, right? So, so what are the points that are distance D away from, away from this line L? Here's my line L, what's distance D away? And if you think about it a little bit, you can be like, okay, well, well, if you go like straight up, you know, if you go straight up, that, that would give you truly distance D. But if I'm going to be coming a little bit at an angle, then, then this would be significantly shorter. You know, this would be coming down and be a little bit shorter. So you can imagine, and then as, as I go further and further out, as I go further and further out, it's getting even shorter and shorter. So it should be some kind of, some kind of curve that, that has its like peak right here and then it's getting closer and closer to your line. And, and same thing as you go the other direction. So there's a nice symmetry there. And so let's try to, let's try to draw this. Let me use a, a new color, let's call it draw in blue. It will look something like this. I have a rough mound up there and then, and then it'll come down. Something, something like this. Okay, that's probably not the best drawing, but, but we can go ahead and try and describe this curve analytically. So say you have some point on this curve. Let's pick some point on here. Let's call this curve the collection of points X, Y that a distance D away from the line. So, so let's think about what that means. Well, each of these lines we can think of as being 
just some line, since it passed through the origin, each of these lines is some line y equals ax. And so what that means is that means that this point right down here, well, we know its height is going to be at b. And so then we can recover that the um, x coordinate of the point will just be at b over a. Is that is that right? Because then you get the right you get the right slope here, so that b over a times a gives you your y value of of b, right? So that's what this point is of the form, and and I want to find so a a is some variable a is changing. You know I have a different a for this guy than this guy than this guy. My a is a variable. It's changing, but but once I once I specify what this point is. I can then figure out what this point x, y is because I'll have the relationship that the distance between the point x, y and this point is d. So in particular, that gives me that x minus this x value, b minus a squared plus y minus this y value, b squared is, is your distance squared, is your d squared. So that's one relationship you have between um, this point x, y, and this other point. And then the second fact we can use is that this point x, y is, is on this line y equals ax. So I also have the relationship y equals ax. Now, now my a here is also a variable. So don't, don't think a is constant. A, a is also a variable. We'll come back and we'll deal with that. <coughs> well, let's deal with it now. You know, if a equals, if y equals ax, that means that your a is y over x. So we can substitute that in up here. And that will give us x minus b times the reciprocal of a. So that gives you bx over y squared plus y minus b squared is d squared. And then let me just multiply both sides by a y squared to clean this up a little bit. So multiplying the left by, by a y squared and multiplying the right by a y squared. You can bring a y into this first term. <coughs> so you're left with xy minus bx squared plus y squared times y minus b squared equals d squared y squared. Or I suppose if you want to clean it up even more, you could, you could pull the x out of there. So if I pull this x out, it'll come out as an x squared, but then I just have a y minus b squared. So both these terms have a y minus b squared. So I get an x squared plus a y squared times y minus b squared is d squared y squared. And, and that becomes a description for the set of these points, this collection of points that are distance d from the line. Notice that this equation has x's and y's. It has b, but, but our b is fixed. Our b is whatever that, that b is. And, and then it has d, which is also some fixed quantity. So we eliminated the variable a. And so this is a nice, nice expression for this, for this curve. The last thing we can then do is we can say, well, we weren't really interested in this curve. What we're interested in <clears throat> is where this curve crosses over the line M, right? You can, you can think you have, you had some curve here, but, but the point is going to be given by where it intersects M. So, so if you want to know <clears throat> where this, where this other point is, we need to think about where this crosses M. And, you know, I don't know what M looks like. M could be anything, but, but whatever M is, you know, maybe, maybe M is like this, but that M is just some, some linear relationship. It's just some Y equals M X plus B. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equation for M and then I'm going to plug it into the equation for my, for my blue curve here. And then you'll end up with well, what do we get? We get x squared plus 
mx plus b squared times mx plus b minus b, so that's just mx squared <laughs> equals d squared times mx plus b squared. Now this kind of looks like a mess, but, but all I want you to notice is that this is a quadratic in x times a quadratic in x. So this is a quartic. This is a degree four equation in x. And here's another quadratic in x. But, but you, know, you, can, you can express this just as a nice quartic. This is just some degree four polynomial in x. So, so let's write that down. This is a quartic. And so you can think that you were given some, some point D, um, some point um, O, and then with, with this new operation, we were able to recover these new points. And, and we just found that that new point is the root or solution of, of some quartic, right? We can find the X and then the Y values by solving this quartic out. And so just as before with just compass and straight edge, we had found that intersecting them gives you solutions of a quadratic. Now we would say that solving using a compass and marked ruler. So now in this new setting, alpha is constructible with, with compass and marked ruler means that alpha is a root of a quartic, a degree four polynomial, or, or lower. You know, you can, of course, you can still get the quadratics. You can still get um, linear. You can also get cubics. So, so it, it's a, a quartic degree four or lower. OK, cool. So, so the move from a, a straight edge to a marked ruler is a move from just solving quadratic equations to solving cubic and quartic equations. Now, before we had had that solving this quadratic means that we're just extending by some, we're just extending by some square root. What is the case now? Well, we saw that we're extending by square root. That's a nice operation that we know how to do. And we showed how you can actually you know, extend, get, get that square root of A using a compass and straight edge. Using a compass and marked ruler, you can still, of course, still get the square root of A. So, so we have a similar situation where you're going to have some tower of fields where Q is inside of some, some extension inside of some extension, and you're gonna be able to keep extending until you get up to f of k, which is q extended by your alpha. So you can extend. And at each step, your f of n can be obtained by f of n minus 1. Doing what? Well, it could still be, it could still be a square root, just like before. Or we've also seen that you can extend by a cube root. So last, last lecture, we saw how you can recover the cube root. Or last lecture, we also saw you can trisect an angle. So let's think what that means. And in these first two cases, you had your A was in f of n minus 1. In this last case, you can imagine what you're doing is, is you had some angle that was in f of n minus 1. So, so we would say that cosine of some of some theta was in f of n minus one. And then you're extending by cosine of one third of that theta. So, so this one here just comes from constructing the cube root, where this one here comes from trisecting the angle, trisecting the angle. <coughs> and, and you might think that this cube root is connected to this problem that we talked about before of doubling the cube doubling the cube. So these impossible problems the Greeks thought about in trisecting the angle and doubling the cube, well, at least those two are solved, we said, by, by um, 
allowing ourselves to use a marked ruler instead of a straight edge. And, and it turns out those are the only um, three things you need to do. That if alpha is a root of, of a quartic, so this, there's some algebra behind this, but you can, you can uh, run through this, that you can solve those quartic equations by, by just using square roots and cube roots and, and something that's analogous to um, taking, um, solving this, solving this, um, trisecting this angle. And, and maybe I'll just remind you, so like, where does, where does this come from? Like, how is this related to the, these portics or um, cubics or anything like that? <coughs> and, and so um, recall the idea there is just that we have this, this uh, relationship. So, so I'll, I'll just note over here, note, we have this like triple angle formula that cosine of three times some angle is, oh, I think I'm, I'm gonna mess this up. I think it's four cosine cubed of the angle minus three cosine of the angle, right? So, so this comes from using a sum of angle formulas and you, then do the other necessary trig identities to get down to this relationship. But what that means is, is that means that um, cosine of one third um, theta would just be a root of, <coughs> of the quadratic four X cubed minus three X minus cosine of theta to zero. So it's a root of something whose coefficients were in this original field, f of n minus one. But then that root itself lives in the slightly larger field if, if, if cosine of one third of theta isn't in f of n minus one. Maybe it is, maybe it's something like 90 degrees where you can already trisect it in the field you're in, you don't have to extend it. Okay. So, so hopefully this is showing an analogous story to, to what you have up here. And then the, the, the last part of this analogy is, so what is, what is this degree? Well, above, we said that the degree of extending by alpha is two to the K, because at each step, you're just adding a square root, which is a degree to extension. You come down here, you're like, well, what are you doing now at each step? You could be adding a square root or a cube root or something else, which is a solution to some degree three um, polynomial. And so now each step you should think is either a degree two extension or a degree three extension. And so the last thing we'll say <coughs> is that alpha being constructible by straight edge and marked ruler means the degree of alpha, of a degree of Q extended by alpha over Q will be well, it could be some combination extending by twos and threes. So let's say it's like two to the J times three to the K. Okay, and so there's the analogous story. There, there's the analogous story for compass and, and marked ruler. The last thing I wanna do now is I want to think about, well, what does this mean for the kinds of polygons we can construct? So, so let's go back and remember, what do I mean by, by constructing polygons? So a regular n-gon, so this is an old problem, going back to at least Euclid. Can we construct the regular n-gon? And so Euclid had constructed like the three-gon, the, the equilateral triangle the five gone, the, the regular pentagon. And you'd also done the 15 gone, right? And of course the four gone, the, the, the square. Um, and then it wasn't until Gauss that we got the 17 gone. Gauss came and showed us how to do the, the regular 17 gone with compass and straight edge. And in general, you can think that constructing the regular n gone means you just want to be able to construct cosine of two pi over n. Because if you have a circle, that's not a circle. If you have the circle, 
and you have some point here then if I want to construct, you know, whatever God I'm trying to construct, if this is going to be one, one side of it, this is going to be one side of that God, and this is the center of the circle, then this would just be the angle of 2 pi divided by n. And that angle is constructible precisely when you can figure out what this x value is, right? So, so this is just the x value right here of this length right here would just be cosine of two pi over n. Okay, so we wanna know when we can construct cosine of two pi over n. And, and let, me, let me, for now, again, we're gonna restrict ourselves to using a compass and straight edge, but then once we understand this one a little bit better, we'll tell the story again using a compass and marked ruler. So, so right now we're using compass and straight edge. Well, constructing cosine of two pi over n, or constructing these n points on the circle, recall is equivalent in, in more analytical terms of constructing the nth roots of unity. So if we think about the circle as being the unit circle in the complex plane, and we just let this point right here be, let's let's get ourselves a little more room for this. Be the point z given by cosine of two pi over n plus i sine of two pi over n, which is the same thing as e to the i two pi over n. <coughs> Well, that z is, is a root of the uh, polynomial x to the n minus one. So it's a, it's a solution to x to the n minus one. There, there are n solutions to this, right? Which just happen when you rotate z around the unit circle. To get z squared, z cubed, and so forth z to the n minus one, z to the n, which is just one. And so those give you the, the solutions. Okay, <clears throat> great. So, what we wanna think about is, is when can we construct these? And, and we've already said that this z is, is a root of x to the n minus one. But that's not the only thing it's a root of, right? Yes, it is a root of x to the n minus one. But there's, there's a simpler polynomial that these guys are roots of. And, and so like, just, just think about this like simple example. You know, if you had like your fourth roots of unity, fourth roots of unity, that would be precisely the four extremes, you get these four points. That's just one minus one i and minus i. And that makes sense because x to the fourth minus one factors as x minus one, x plus one, times x minus i times x plus i because these first two multiply out to x squared minus one and then these last two multiply out to x squared plus one okay and it's like yes your i here which is your fourth root of unity it's the first one this would be like your this would be your this would be your z and then you'd have z squared z cubed and z to the four, which is one. Your z is a root of x to the fourth minus one. But like that's too big of a, you can think that's like too much because you don't need, you don't need that whole polynomial. If you're just looking for a rational polynomial that z is a root of, you would say, well, I, I could have just, I could have just picked, you know, these two guys. 
And, and then I would also have that Z, my I, which, which is I, is a root of the this, this smaller polynomial x squared plus one. And somehow that's giving you better information because if you were to extend the rationals by Z, it would be a degree two extension, not a degree four extension. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a root of x squared plus one. And so let's think like, why, why was it these two? And, and one way you can think about it is, well, what I and, and minus I have in common is they correspond to Z and Z cubed. And, and those powers one and three are the values that are relatively prime with four. So you can really think Z is a root of the product of X minus Z's to the N. Uh, let's do X minus Z to the A, where A is relatively prime with N. And that this product will always give you a polynomial, which is in the rationals. It's actually integer. It's actually an integer polynomial, but, but all we need is it's in the rationals. So like all of the imaginary parts just cancel out just right, just right to give you something in the, in the rationals. So you can think a little bit more about why that's the case, but, but there's some sense in which if you just pick the right ones, the ones that are relatively prime, that will give you everything that's inside of Q. And so what that gives you is if you're thinking about the degree of extending Q by Z over Q in general, it's just going to be the number of, the number of guys from one to N that are relatively prime with n. And this value here has a special name, which we call the Euler phi function. So I'll call this phi of n. <coughs> so, so let's just um, try to build a little bit of intuition about this really fast. And then we'll bring it back and we'll see how that helps us with constructability. So Say I want to know what is phi of, of six. Can someone, can someone tell me? What is phi of six? How many guys are relatively prime with six from one up to six? You can do like a little check. It's like, well, one is, two is not, three is not. These are not relatively prime of six. Four is not, five is, and then of course six is not. So, so this is two, right? How about more generally, what is phi of a prime number P? <coughs> phi of a prime number P, well, how many guys are relatively prime of P? Well, everything would be relatively prime of P that's smaller than P. So it's just P minus one, P minus one, because everything from one to two, all the way up to P minus one will have no common factors with P. And then, and then you can think a little bit more, like what if it's P to some power? What if it's a prime number to like some power? And, and there you have to like convince yourself that, okay, well now there are things that are going to um, have common factors, particularly all the smaller powers of P, right? Like, like, so like one up through P minus one will all be relatively prime, but your P will not be relatively prime if P to the K because P and P to the K have P in common. And then like your P plus one is good all the way up to like P squared minus one, but your P squared you'll have to throw out because P squared and P to the K both have a common factor of, of P. And, and so you end up with, well, it's all of them, but you have throughout all these powers of K, P and how many of them are there? Well, it's P to the one up until you get to the P to the K. So there's K minus one of them. So there becomes your general expression for P of K. And then the last thing, um, last property I'll mention is if you have two numbers that are relatively prime, say A and B, 
where a and b is one, uh, relatively prime, then it turns out that phi of a times b is just phi of a times phi of b. Now this is kind of a deep result that this actually is, is essentially the statement of the Chinese remainder theorem. This is what the Chinese remainder theorem gives you. So we won't go into this right now, but this is a nice little number theory fact. And, and you can think about why that's true. So if you come back over here, like why did phi of six come out to be two? Well, the real reason phi of six came out to be two, you might think, which is because phi of six is phi of two times phi of three. And then since two and three are primes, that's just two minus one times three minus one, which is two. <clears throat> okay, so, so we get these properties. And, and so now it might seem like we've gone pretty far a trail from thinking about, thinking about um, you know, constructability, but let's go back and let me remind you what we're doing here. We wanna know when can we construct cosine of two pi over n, which is asking when can we construct when can we construct this nth root of unity? But we're gonna be able to construct that exactly when phi of n is, well, we want it to be the right kind of extension. We want the degree of this extension to be like two to some power. And so it turns out that this is constructible exactly when you have phi of n is just two to a power. <coughs> And then we can think about like, when, when is phi of n two to some power? So, so it turns out that that then is equivalent to saying that n must be of the form two, oh, I'm gonna need some new letters, two to a power times P1, P2 through um, PM, where these are distinct primes, and each prime is of the form two to some power plus one. Okay, so let's take a second to see why this makes sense. So, so what would phi, what would phi of this n be? So let's just maybe come over here to the right and do it. So, so why, why are these equivalent? Well, phi of this n would be, this is phi of two to the j times p1, p2, all the way through pm. Since those are distinct primes, um, they, they're all relatively prime with each other. So we can, we can factor this, we can write this as, phi of two to the j times phi of each prime, phi of pm. Therefore, this product will be of the form two to a power only if each piece is of the form two to a power. Well, let's check that each piece is of the form two to a power. How about this first piece? What is like, you know, what is phi of, of two to the j? Well, since that's a, a prime to a power, that's just going to be two to the j minus two to the j minus one, which is just two to the j minus one, right? Because two to the j minus one is half of two to the j. So sure enough, that's two to a power. So that piece is like good. And then how do you get, how do you get these guys to be of the form of two to some power? Well, remember that phi of a prime is just that prime minus one. So you want that prime minus one to be you know, two to some power. So that prime better be two to a power plus one, right? Okay, so, so maybe that explains a little bit more, a little bit better where you know, the seemingly mysterious description comes from. Well, there's one more thing we can actually insist upon. I said that this is just two to a power. But I claim that it's actually, it's actually two to a power of two to a power. You know, maybe I should use a different letter, like S plus one. That is, I claim that R 
has no odd prime pieces, that r is itself just a power of two. And, and that just comes from the fact that that's the only way you can get a prime number. Because if you had, if, you, if this had been two, two, your r had been, some, had some odd piece in it. So maybe, maybe it had some odd piece. Maybe it was like, why can't it be two to the odd plus one? So, so why, why is this never prime? You know, why is this never a prime number? Well, this is never a prime number, so I claim this is not prime. <coughs> because x plus 1 divides x to some odd plus 1. You know, whenever you have an odd power, x plus 1 divides it. Why does x plus 1 divide this? You know, like if, if you forget, like that's just because minus 1 is a root. Negative one is a root of this. You know, plug negative one in. Negative one to an odd power gives you negative one. So this becomes zero. And since negative one's a root, that means x plus one must divide it, right? It has a factor, which is x plus one. And so in particular, since x plus one divides x to the odd plus one, that would give you that two plus one or three always divides two to the odd plus one. But actually, it's something even stronger than that. It can't just be two to the odd, but there can be no there can be no odd piece at all. So then you might be like, well, why why can't it be like two to the like odd times some power of two? You know, times two to the um, I'm running out of letters here. Uh, t times two to the t. Why can't I have something like that? Well, if I had something like that then you can think this is the same thing as, well, I could write that as x to the 2 to the t to the odd plus 1. But x to the 2 to the t plus 1 divides that, right? So, so this is extending this argument from below. So in particular, I can't have something <coughs> of this form because that would then give me that, you know, uh, two to the two to the t plus one will divide two to the two to the t to the odd plus one. So I can't have any odd pieces at all in my power of two if I want this number to come out to be prime. So just by saying this number is prime, I actually get it's two to some to some, to some power of two to plus one. So what are those primes? You know, what are those primes? So those primes include the prime three, because if you plug in S equals zero, you get a one here, which is two to the one plus one, which is three. It includes, if you plug in S equals one, you get a four plus one, which gives you five. Oh, wow, these are, these are exactly what Euclid had found. He had gotten the numbers, he had constructed a regular three gone and a regular five gone, and a 15 gone where he just had a three times a five, right? And, and then of course you could double those as much as you want. And then what happens if you plug in the next value of S? The next value of S is three, but two to the three is, is, is eight. No, I'm sorry, the next value of two, T is, um, S is two, we haven't done two yet. 2 to the 2 is 4. 2 to the 4 is 16. And then 16 plus 1 gives you 17. And that's what Gauss had done. And, and then so forth, etc. Okay. <clears throat> How would this change if instead of doing compass and straight edge, so, so let's come back to this discussion. What if instead of doing compass and straight edge, we want to do compass and a marked ruler? Well, now to construct the eigengon, it's still constructing two pi over n. But now, instead of you wanting your degree to be two to the k, you allow it to be two to the k times three to the j. And, and you can just think this is inspired from this result over here, where we said that the degree of your extension is some power of two times some power of three. It's a little more you can show there, but, but that's the idea. <laughs> And therefore, we just want, well, it's almost the same thing, 
But these primes now, when, when we do this analysis, we want them to come out to be two to some power times three to some powers. So the prime minus one should be that. So the prime isn't just gonna be two to a power plus one, but instead it's gonna be two to a power times three to a power plus one. And so now the primes we get, a much larger class of primes, you have, sure enough, like you would still have three in there, but you would also have five. And then you can think, it's like, do you, do you get seven? Yeah, because two times three gives you six, plus one gives you seven. <clears throat> and then you can be like, do I get 11? No, I don't get 11 because that's one more than two times five and I don't have five. So, you know, I still can't do like an 11 gone, but I could do a seven gone now. Um, and then you can keep going. Like, do I get uh, 13? Yeah, 13 is just, is just um, one more than 12, which is a product of twos and threes. So you can also construct a 13 gone now when you couldn't before, still construct a 17 gone, and et cetera. So there are some things you still can't construct, like an 11 gone, but, but at least you can now construct like a seven gone, a 13 gone, whereas you couldn't before. Okay, cool. So hopefully, hopefully that gives you a nice overview of, of what you can do, not only with the compass and straight edge, but, but what happens when you allow yourself to use a marked ruler instead.